Welcome to the AI Hackathon Salzburg. Welcome to the first AI Hackathon Salzburg. Welcome to you all, our participants, our speakers, our churches, our viewers online, and of course, welcome as well to the whole AI Hackathon team. My name is Karen Gabriel, and I have the pleasure of being your host today and tomorrow part of the Hackathon. This Hackathon was set up to create or strengthen the community around digital transformation, primarily in the Salzburg area in Austria. And our goal is to create an awareness of how artificial intelligence is changing our lives and our society. This hackathon for you, our participants, is an opportunity to first of all, play around and get familiar with the great tool GPT-3. You also get a chance to network with each other and to work in a team under time pressure and successively develop a prototype. And of course, you also get to connect with the AI Hackathon team, with our experts on AI. I'm very excited to inform you that this hackathon is being conducted and was developed in partnership with Deep Learning Labs by NextGrid. We'd later get to hear about NextGrid from the founder, Matthias himself. But basically, they want to inspire hackers to build new solutions based on powerful tech such as AI. So what's the goal and what's the plan for today and tomorrow as part of the hackathon? Well, after my introductions, I'm going to hand over to Matthias. And as I said, he is the CEO and co-founder of NextGrid AI and Neonative. Then we'll hear from Clemens on how AI is influencing new businesses. And Clemens is the CEO and founder of Enlite AI, but he's also the co-founder of AI Austria. And then starting at 2, uh, 2 p.m., it's your time, your time to really get to work and hack. And we have mentors provided for you today and tomorrow. They're dedicating their time and expertise to help you. They are available today until 8 p.m. But of course, you are more than welcome to continue working after 8 p.m. So if you are, you know, have still enough energy and passion to continue working late into night, you're more than half welcome to do so. Then tomorrow, Saturday, a very important deadline for you, 1 p.m. At 1 p.m., we would love to receive your presentations, your final presentations. And then we'll hear again from Matthias and Clemens on how they have turned ideas into successful businesses. Hackathons are a great source to not only meet exciting people and people who are interested in the same subjects as you, but maybe also to create an idea that really has the potential to be turned into a business. And you'll hear from those two experts what the lessons that they have learned, but also, for example, the support to your systems they have used when it comes to financing the initial start of your business. And then at 2 p.m., the stage is all yours, and we want to hear from each team the solution that they have built. So I'm really curious. I'm really excited. Um, and this is also the time where your judges, and you'll get to meet them tomorrow, will evaluate your presentation. Because in the end, we want to understand as well who are the best performing teams. And we're going to announce the winners after the judges have submitted their scores, so around 5 PM tomorrow. And then, of course, unfortunately, we can't meet in person. But we also want to use an opportunity to provide you a social networking opportunity. And from around 5 to 6 PM, we kind of like all chill together and connect socially online and just celebrate having successfully um, delivered and participated in the AI Hackathon Salzburg. All right. So I would say 
we now really hear from the experts um, and they have the hands on experience when it comes to understanding not only how AI is influencing our society, but also what it means for our businesses. And I have the pleasure of handing over to Matthias. Uh, Matthias, as you can see, is wearing actually two hats. He's the CEO and co-founder of NextGrid AI, and he's also the co-founder of New Native, um, a very interesting community. His presentation is going to be on the magic of AI. And I think that's a really interesting title. And I'm curious to learn more about him. And let me just reconfirm that Matthias is all set up and ready. And we can then add him. Uh, we're waiting still for Matthias. Perfect. Then I'll take like this opportunity minutes. to give you more details about, um, about the hackathon. Let me just skip a few slides. And I think what's really important for you to know as well are actually the different stages and what this hackathon is all about. So this looks very complicated, but believe me, it's not. It's actually quite simple. After our keynote speeches today, you get to meet your teams on Discord. I think you're already on Discord. If not, let us know, we'll onboard you. And you also have received an email about two to three days ago with the Discord link. Great. Um, and this is the first stage. All of the other stages, I promise, I'll tell you all the details after the talks of Matthias and Clemens. But I see Matthias has joined us. So Matthias, welcome to the AI Hackathon Salzburg. Thank you so much. You have you here. It's a pleasure um, to be here. Yeah, we're really excited. And I mean, you have a fantastic team who has been supporting us. They're also working uh, backstage. You are also one of the mentors, which I think is brilliant because your wealth of expertise can be very beneficial for the participants. Um, tell us a bit more about the magic of AI, <clears throat> handing over to you. With pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, OK, I'll see. I'll share my screen now. One second. Yes. Perfect. We can see your screen and it already says the magic of AI. So it's a question mark. I want to hear the answer. <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> yes. So um, let's talk a bit about the uh, magic of uh, AI and why it's really are becoming super relevant and really matters right now. <clears throat> So shortly about uh, myself, uh, my name is Matthias. Uh, I'm from Sweden originally. Uh, nowadays, mostly based in uh, Warsaw, Poland, but uh, also uh, spending quite some time in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm an AI technologist and uh, in investor. Uh, my mission is pretty much to, to accelerate innovation by uh, creating the infrastructure and framework that allows uh, modern tech companies, uh, especially AI companies, to move really fast and actually go after solving big problems and taking big uh, markets. Uh, I'm founder of uh, NextGrid, that is an AI accelerator for early stage AI companies. Um, said to be and ranked among the top AI accelerators in the world. Uh, also founded the Deep Learning Labs, uh, which is our organization where we try to get access to and lift out state-of-art AI technologies for talents all around the world to come and build with. Um, and the organization that are facilitating all our initiatives is called New Native. Uh, so we hope to be able to do uh, a lot uh, moving forward, both when it comes to uh, stimulating the ecosystem and uh, supporting the makers and the talents uh, behind it. Okay, that's enough about me. Uh, if you want to connect, take a screenshot, take a picture there, and you will find the 
Oops. Embarrassing. It's not supposed to push a space there, maybe. Okay. So what is artificial intelligence uh, exactly? So artificial intelligence, AI, uh, sometimes called machine, is application of intelligence demonstrated by machines. Uh, uh, there is nothing intelligent in AI, uh, um, but there is a way to try uh, uh, dopamine, how that is uh, transmitted. Uh, but what AI uh, today is it uh, basically allows uh, computers to uh, create functions or uh, identify correlations in data. So basically uh, we're utilizing the power of the compute uh, to more or less uh, brute force our way forward to a result. And then we're using things such as uh, neural networks to actually be able to store these uh, patterns and information. So I just want to run through uh, um, a little bit how AI have progressed over the years because it actually matters a lot. Um, because if you talk about AI with people, you can get very, very mixed uh, reactions. And uh, this is highly understood. Uh, when it comes from an uh, investment perspective, uh, where I will go through a bit here, I will, I will tell a bit about the history and how we kind of ended up in this scenario. Mm, so AI, I would say it first through first big uh, uh, breakthrough in the <clears throat> in the common space was around 2016. Uh, Google was putting uh, tons of resources uh, through uh, DeepMind uh, to basically try to win in the game Go. Uh, at the time, this was seen as the ultimate challenge. Um, so at the, um, uh, I don't remember the exact date now, but uh, uh, somewhere in 2016, they uh, managed to beat the best player in the world. You have a great uh, YouTube documentary you can watch about this uh, for anyone that are more interested. Uh, but with this also suddenly around 70% of all tech startups uh, pitching was using artificial intelligence. Uh, so after that we could, okay, it will be my next slide, but so after that not super much happened. Um, a lot of focus was within reinforcement learning and once again, uh, DeepMind, DeepMind uh, managed to build a, uh, a reinforcement learning model that was able to beat the uh, top players in StarCraft, uh, which was a big achievement, but still kind of in the digital, the gaming world, so hard for people to directly uh, relate to. Um, OpenAI uh, countered DeepMind. Uh, and won back-to-back uh, -back games uh, in uh, uh, Dota 2 uh, against the world uh, champions. So basically, in you have a lot of AI research lab, uh, but the most well-known and uh, that are making the most uh, breakthroughs, uh, I would say, is uh, uh, DeepMind. Uh, that is uh, uh, runs under uh, Google's flag. And then we have uh, OpenAI that was uh, founded by uh, uh, very well-known people in, in the tech world. It, uh, Elon Musk was part of founding it, actually, and um, a guy called uh, Greg Brockman that was part of building up Stripe, was the CTO there, and uh, Sam Altman that was the CEO of Y Combinator. Okay. 
but very little real world um, usable products came out during this year and it was still extremely hard to build anything in AI uh, and it required a lot of uh, both computing knowledge but also mathematical knowledge. Uh, so without a couple of really solid uh, years in the area, someone could more or less forget to be able to build uh, anything closely remote to a uh, uh, good AI solution. So the biggest uh, breakthrough happened uh, in May 2020 when OpenAI released something called um, GPT-3. Uh, uh, generative pre-trained text transformer tree, uh, which, which is capable of doing a lot of interesting things with the text. And I will showcase, I uh, will do some showcases uh, a bit into the presentation. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, this one did now allow us to suddenly both write text, but also extract information and basically process unstructured data in ways we never had seen before. Uh, and once again, AI kind of came up in the, in the bigger uh, limelight. But if we look back and we're looking at the, at the progression uh, over this year, so uh, since 2000, well, the computing power had been growing uh, seven times faster than Moore's law. Uh, so basically we have seen since 2012 a doubling of computing power behind AI every 90 days. Uh, and everyone understands that there that is starting to add up pretty quick. And in some tests that have been done uh, trying to solve the same task, uh, we can see that uh, solving that task 2019 compared to 2012 required 44 times less computing power. So if you just add those two parameters that we have uh, computing behind AI going uh, uh, rapidly up and at the same time we get more efficient algorithms. Uh, make AI progressing with, yeah, we have calculated that around, uh, you can see around 175% progression per, per year. And if we look at some more financial data, we can see pretty much the, what I uh, explained regarding the AlphaGo and Go and everything. So, here it kind of got the, it, its hype and we could see investment into the space sky rocket uh, 2018 and, and uh, at that point uh, AI was still pretty bad with uh, performance uh, uh, ridiculously bad uh, on uh, 19 performance increase and basically are on here uh, current. So anyone that uh, would say that AI is a hype word or uh, AI doesn't have the performance are not uh, have not understood uh, where AI are today and probably they got burned in some uh, bad investment around uh, 2017-2019. So if we look at some uh, more modern numbers, uh, we're looking 2021 here, uh, we can see that as performance actually started to happening, uh, started 2019, I would say uh, it, it, it started around 2018, but 2019 AI started to become actually useful and useful uh, to put in application. 
uh, without you needing uh, uh, from the. Uh, and with that, uh, we can see that um, uh, exits in in AI uh, started to increase a lot. And if we look uh, again from a bit of a hardware point of view, so this was a recent study, uh, um, a recent study by NVIDIA that shows that uh, progression within the area just keep uh, keep consistently increasing. Uh, and why why is this? Uh, <clears throat> I would say the main factor is that. Uh, AI pretty much it's automation of compute. Uh, it happens to be that neural networks is among the most efficient uh, technologies today. But as soon as we manage to solve automation in in a, in an area in tech, that means that now we can now we can actually solve further problems a lot faster, which kind of create a pro acceleration, so an acceleration of acceleration. So to take a more um, uh, uh, relatable example, we can take uh, Google. So they uh, they were uh, designing unique uh, processors or silicon uh, for AI tasks. So um, uh, designing a processor was uh, around a uh, twelve to eighteen months process uh, to do it. Then they created an AI system able to actually design these processors. Uh, for them, and suddenly they could uh, design and uh, get a prototype out of new processor in about two weeks. Uh, and the same apply in any other area. So a tool I will show you in a, in a bit called, for example, Codex, also from OpenAI. Uh, it allows developers to write code about 50% faster today. So, while we could see quite some exciting stuff uh, happening 2020, 2021, uh, this is actually now 2022 is the year where AI is about to transform the whole computing industry and the way we work with computers more or less. To draw some examples. So let me have a copy some here. Okay, one second. If that helps us. We have some um, technical problems. Really? 
string cash. We have some difficult uh, difficulties of technical reasons. Uh, Matthias will be back in seconds. It's right. Maybe you can say I will be back in a second. Because I can't do anything. You need to say I will be back in a minute. Okay, guys. Uh, sorry for that. It was too many, too many screens, too many code editors, cameras, streaming, and um, yeah, never get a MacBook uh, Pro with i nine i nine processor. So okay, we can't find them. So, so basically, now what I want to uh, show you guys is some is some uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, I'm just gonna grab a text here. Okay. Start with this one. Uh, so I will showcase uh, GPT-3 here, which is actually um, something you have available uh, during the hackathon event. And I'm really excited to see what everyone comes up with and, and build on this. Uh, so with GPT-3, it can do things like, so for example, it can easily summarize any text. Now we have a text in here. But I'm thinking, let's find some new text. So here we basically got a short summarization, but let me try to find something from your university. Mm, yeah, okay. Just want to show, show you guys what I'm taking. So I just jumped in here. And, FH Salzburg, and here we have some uh, text about things happened 2020. So let's jump back to the transformer here and we try it out. So we, we, we can tell GPT-3, for example, uh, please summarize this text for me. Uh, 
and it's able to do that in in quite good fashion and here of course with any type of uh, code or algorithms or anything uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, tweakings and settings and so on that can be done gpt3 actually have uh, uh, 175 billion parameters so yeah that's uh, about how many ways you can uh, and put your input and get the various output. Uh, yeah, so here we also, we ask it, uh, make a Q&A, uh, uh, put in four uh, potential answers, one should be correct. Uh, what is the name of the new certificate course that will start autumn 2020? So, um, I have no idea, but I uh, guess would be B. Okay, A, <laughs> hopefully, or D maybe. Uh, and we could also uh, explain for a seven-year-old, five-year-old, three-year-old, whatever you prefer. And then it can kind of simplifies the text. Something useful, uh, I hope to see, uh, it would be really cool to see anyone building, say, a uh, application that simply just uh, record a sound of any lecture and then you transcribe that into a text format and then you feed it into uh, GPT-3, for example, and have that create uh, uh, study notes or what you are looking for. Uh, now we have a, the layout or more to wish for but here basically it creates the, the study notes uh, and here we can ask it to make a long text about something so um, yeah okay. And it can be in various lengths. So th this is just uh, uh, four or five examples out of millions of uh, 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 potential applications you actually can build. Uh, and then 2000, so what happened? We had a GPT-3 and then 2021 actually uh, OpenAI released something called Codex. Uh, Codex is... Uh, just an extra trained version of GPT-3 where it's been tra uh, uh, trained on GitHub uh, material. Um, and this one can do anything with code and current, uh, the latest data show that people that are coding backed or empowered by this system are coding up to 50% faster. Huh? Oh. Sorry, I forgot to change the tab. Coding up to 50% faster. Um, currently today we need developers for every little trans translation between uh, our vision or blueprint and to actually get it to work on iPhone, Android, uh, Chrome web browser, uh, Safari web browser. But yeah, it, it, it's uh, just layer of layer of layer of layer. Uh, now this is a quite a little stupid playground thing here you can use codex for much much more sophisticated things such as allow karen 65 to do advanced sql requests just by explaining to the system or automatically write a testing code but we, we can try something here so like uh, uh make a red circle in the center of the screen Yeah, uh, uh, brown, yellow, and a blue border to circle, and also a shadow to the circle. Yeah, looking good. And then we can even do things like this, that... Um, uh, 
push an arrow, please move the circle two pixel in the direction of the key. And the arrow key. Okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> yes. So yeah, now, now I'm pushing the keys here and the circle move around. Uh, I could show you guys uh, stuff the whole day, but the last thing I want to show is the latest thing called Dali e 2 um, all of this is actually based on the uh, same type of uh, technology. Uh, the common word is transformers. The more technical is GANs, uh, Genetric Adversary Networks. So DALI 2 is the latest uh, uh, thing from OpenAI. And this model is able to create photorealistic images as well as various art and so just by uh, a piece of text. So here, astronaut riding a horse in photorealistic style. So maybe take a bowl of soup. So it can do basically any any different style. Uh, so if we just Google on Dolly two images, we get a whole array uh, of images here, and all of this is created by uh, Dolly two. Uh, so here, for example, um, the input was teddy bears working on new AI research on the moon, and we get this one. Or, um, yeah, I don't know the dog breed, uh, but with a hat. So endless. So you, as you can see, is that AI is just not impacting the digital world. Now it's starting to impact media, which is partly digital then, but we don't really see this as areas where AI actually would come in like this. Uh, but what happens if, what happens when uh, organizations say in USA starting to use codex when they code it, code 50% faster, they use DAL E for images and so on. Uh, what basically what we end up with then is, uh, yeah, uh, not good for Europe at all uh, because we are very much uh, a region in the world uh, heavily uh, dependent on human resources and production. Uh, and right now the biggest uh, uh, technology shift ever is happening. It's going to displace a lot of jobs. It's going to create a, a lot of new uh, jobs. And I really encourage everyone to get into this and try it out, regardless if you have a heavy technical background or not. The reality is when looking at, for example, GPT-3, those that often come up with the really great ideas are people that are not so nested into coding, for example, because uh, uh, people like me and maybe some of you that are heavily into coding and computers, we don't know so much. That's our domain knowledge. So to actually get people in with domain knowledge from other fields, and have them uh, uh, talk about and explain how they are solving day-to-day -to -day tasks today and see if this can be implemented to solve them, that often is something that uh, uh, can render uh, really, really good results. And the bigger question are, will AI eat the world? Yes. Uh, I would say we are, it's the industrialization of computing happening right now, because since the start of computing, we have never been able to really get this to work. We are stacked layer of layer of layer, and we created a hell a lot of uh, uh, positions to just do this translation. But when we can automate it, we will not manually do it anymore. But 
with all big transitions, people don't believe in it. And we have seen countless cases throughout history when both countries or giganormous uh, uh, enterprise companies did not believe a change will come just because things have been a certain way for a bit of time. Yes, so that was everything. <clears throat> Sorry for some uh, technical issues and so here, but I, I hope I've been able to show you some things that will inspire and motivate people and make it exciting to go into this field because while there is very important that we get this going in, in, in Europe, it's also the biggest opportunity in a very, very long time to actually create your own startup and, uh, and uh, build something really significant in the uh, tech and world industry. Uh, now, uh, now, is the, now is the moment in time. Uh, don't wait. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if everyone, anyone want to connect, um, uh, follow this link and you will find my contact details. Uh, I'm especially uh, interested in uh, investing in really interesting uh, uh, AI companies that have hungry uh, founders behind them. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Matthias. Um, you will also be one of the mentors supporting the teams today and tomorrow. And they get a chance to leverage GPT-3. Um, yep. I personally was introduced to GPT-3 about two months ago. Um, I've used it as part of a few workshops. And it's really interesting. Um, we have used it for creating applications. Uh, we have used it for uh, you know, adding a table of the results of a soccer game. And then it creates an, a written article. Um, you can even create a recipe. You can ask it to explain certain things, such as AI or positive thinking. And since we have a lot of students being part of this hackathon, I think what you already mentioned as well is how will this shift and impact tasks of certain jobs, especially, you know, the creation part of it when it comes to designers, coders, journalists. Um, and a question to you, uh, one at twice, uh, since you are very experienced with GPT-3 and our participants will use it as well, what should they, how should they approach the hackathon? Like, what should they keep in mind from your perspective that you would, you know, share with them as a mentor? Kind of what I was saying in the end of the presentation there, because I can see a bit of a pattern working with this and having a lot of, of people. So uh, uh, generally, uh, tech people or, or people with a heavy computing background, we, we, we tend to do the same <laughs> stupid shit every time, uh, uh, like start to generate out a loop of something and so on, or just generate something. But the real power in GPT-3 is to figure out the smart use cases. So yeah. just to mention uh, two that I've seen on, on some recent, uh, uh, the most recent uh, event we had, so we had we had one team there was a group of, of five people we often try to get people uh, so maybe we have 30 percent that are very much from the tech side but we're trying other 70 percent with other domain knowledge so in this team it was a, a woman that was working with they did a lot of um, uh, uh, user interviews to understand products and so on and this is following a very specific system. So once you have the interview, there is this key things you need to extract from the text. Uh, and they was able to implement GPT-3 there and actually get it to perform this task. So that was a, 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 a great use case where it worked really well. The other one team, what they did was that they built a setup. So when you have a uh, uh, online call or, or video conference like we have right now. It, it basically uh, transcribed out the text, so extracted the text from that, uh, and then used the GPT-3 to uh, create notes of all the actionable or, or all actionable decisions that was taken, and also from who that said it. So at the end of the meeting, everyone can get an email actually with the, with the key things decided, because I think Many of us are in various meetings and then the meeting ends and like, okay, what, 
did we actually agree on? Yeah. So, so use cases like that is super powerful. And I'm thinking like the people from the university, they should, uh, they should be familiar with uh, various uh, uh, text content and so where it can be, where it can be applied and, and, and implemented. Fantastic. And I think, I mean, we also allocated the participants into teams. We were also looking for matching diverse fields of studies, because as you said as well, you know, diversity is almost the breeding ground for innovation and collaboration. And I guess sometimes Absolutely. the field of application is closer to home. I think looking at, you know, our day to day work and a study life, where are certain challenges, where can GPT-3 be applied to make our lives a bit easier? Awesome. Yes, what? definitely. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see um, uh, what comes out of it. But it's amazing because really groundbreaking things or solution can be built in a fraction of time what this traditionally would take to do it. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Matthias. And of thank course, you, so you can be reached on Discord. You are one of our mentors. Yes. Great. And now I would like to invite to the virtual stage, so to say, Clemens. Um, Clemens has many hats. He, Clemens, hello. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Where are you based at the moment? Which city are you in? I can't hear you. Um, I can't hear you. At, maybe you're unmuted. Um, but basically, Clemens, you are the CEO and founder of Envit AI. You're also the co-founder of AI Austria, a very important important community, really supporting the growth of the AI community here. And as well, you're the vice president at AI Data and the Robotics Association. And I think now we have sound. Yeah, per yeah perfect. Hello. Yeah, no, the typical wireless earbud problem. Yeah. No, I, I was just making uncool dead jokes. So no, 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 no need to repeat them, but I'm based in Vienna. Vienna. OK, awesome. Great. Well, um, handing over to you, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me and for, for the nice intro. Also, yeah, let's say all, all the best to the students which will participate in the hackathon. It's really, really cool to see that this is now popping up everywhere in, in Austria. It's not just a regional phenom phenomena anymore. I want to use the next 20 minutes to tell you about, on the one hand side, what's going on in Austria, like a very broad perspective. And on the other hand, uh, how does how does an AI project look like? Why is, why is this even a thing to do an AI project? And what are typical business models? So brief, brief rundown what awaits you. First, a little bit of an overview on companies and startups in Austria, then a deep dive on what's going on in research, then business perspective and community. Kicking off with companies and startups. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this graphic here on the right hand side. This is the Austrian AI landscape. This is how, how to call it. It's basically a hobby that became too big. I started, me and my colleagues started doing it in 2017 because out of interest, we wanted to know how many AI companies, research institutions, organizations are there in Austria. So when we started in 2017, it was around 50 to 60 organizations. We are conducting annual updates and the, the most recent version, I will also have later a picture where you can see the entire one, is containing now around 350 entries. So uh, next time someone asks you, is it true that there is no AI in Austria? You can say, yeah, that's true, except for 350 organizations dealing with it. Uh, yeah, more, 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 more to that later. Uh, when it comes to startup activity, so yeah, maybe for the differentiation, the, the entire graphic is startups, corporations, and public organizations. Here, we did a real uh, deep dive on the startups because when you look at international comparisons, this is always purely available on the startup level. So, you know, to make it sort of uh, comparable, apples to apples. Uh, yeah, what you see here, I think in the graphical representation, I don't think this surprises anyone that by far the majority is in Vienna and actually it's also Nowadays, around 55%. It used to be 50%, but this is just a concentration effect because Vienna is just in the middle of Lower Austria and adjacent to, to Burgenland. So Vienna basically is representing three provinces. When it comes to the fast followers, yeah, sorry, it's not Salzburg. I know it's perhaps not the best slide to show, 
but it, it's Styria and Upper Austria. Why is that the case? Uh, the OECD is releasing a report once a year where they show uh, how to say R&D expenditures per province and uh, Graz, or let's say Styria is always the OECD province with the highest R&D spending and Lower Austria is not far between. So you can say it, there's basically a direct correlation between R&D expenditures and AI startup activity. Uh, yeah, the, the number we have around out of the 340 or 50, I mentioned before, 150 of them are really doing exclusively AI stuff, either in a SME setting or a startup setting. And yeah, when it comes to female founders, our rate is just 16%. This, yeah, this is, a, of, of, of course, absolutely, it's a very low number. EU-wide, it's not that bad, I would say, especially countries surrounding us have even lower numbers. I mean, this is nothing to be proud of, but it could be worse. Uh, when it comes to growth, uh, yeah, the, the, the gray bars show the absolute number of startups and the red line is visualizing how was the growth each year. And yeah, naturally, the higher the number becomes, the, the growth is flattening. But what is important to point out here is that even during COVID, we did not have a so-called startup attrition. This means startups going out of business. But even during COVID time, the absolute number of companies was still growing. So yeah, this is actually also, let's say, quite an interesting observation uh, Austria is among the regions with the lowest startup attrition. This means since we started tracking this in 2017, in total around 10 companies went out of business. And this is, this is something you would have in, let's say, comp countries with a similar size on an annual basis. Why is that the case? Uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is actually part of the answer. Because if you look here at the startups and company part above, you will realize there are quite a number of specialized categories like clean tech and green tech. Or we have, for example, sports technology here, or we even have tax technology here. So what does this mean? Uh, Austrian companies typically specialize quite early in their life cycle, which, which vertical or let's say which, which industry they want to work with together with. And as a result, even if the product idea should fail or if they have to do a hard pivot from being a software as a service company towards a, to, towards a time and material like a consulting company, they already have a customer base to build upon. And you have lots of government grants which can make sure that this transition works without you having to sell your car, for, for, for example. So this is definitely something very special. Uh, what the, what else? I mean, the lower part with ecosystem and on, this is clear. You have this everywhere. But in, what is interesting to point out is uh, here in early adopters, both corporate and public, uh, you have nowadays many large corporations in Austria which already have uh, significant AI labs or even their own business units. So it's not just a startup thing or a, or a research thing. It's also nowadays a corporate thing and even a public sector thing, if you think of the city of Vienna. Uh, good. Yeah, the, 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 the landscape I've shown, as I'm, I'm, I'm sure you will receive it in the material afterwards as well. For those of you that want to immediately surf there, it's all available on our homepage. Now, when it comes to notable trends in Austria, I talked a lot about homegrown businesses, organizations, and so on. Uh, what is quite interesting that even from early on, international heavyweights started to have uh, their AI labs in Austria. So, for example, from 2016 onwards already, you had uh, in Graz Amazon Prime Air. This is just one out of 13 labs they in total have globally. And they are dealing with the autonomous navigation of drones and collision avoidance in warehouses. Uh, so this is this was like the, the, the early phase. What then later on, and this is a trend that was then in 2020, especially during COVID, that international companies start to create AI hubs here. What do I mean with an AI hub? As opposed to a research unit, which are perhaps 20 or 30 people just doing research, these AI hubs already take or cover a, a complete function with, within a larger enterprise. So yeah, the, the most famous one here is surely Facebook, or now it's Meta. 
der Mobile Mapping Division ist in Graz, Mapillary, that's the name. Uh, additionally, AI Storm is a, is a Sunicorn, so they almost have a billion dollar valuation. This is an edge AI startup. They're making chips specialized on image detection and their entire R&D stuff and chip design stuff is also sitting in Graz, although the rest of the company is located in Silicon Valley. And last but not least, I, I always say this is like a phase and now the, the most recent phase is that companies really open their European headquarter or even global headquarter in Austria, although originally they are not from Austria. Like Crayon is a billion dollar company from Norway, Norway. And Brainbox AI is a gigantic startup when it comes to building management and energy optimization of buildings. So yeah, long, long story short, things are running actually quite well. Uh, when it now comes on the corporate side, I briefly mentioned this before, but it's very interesting to see uh, that corporates also go in the direction of productization. What does this mean? In the past, if there were companies, let's say, yeah, you're, you're in Salzburg, you definitely know Porsche Informatik and Porsche Consulting. So basically back then you had the car maker, they had the internal service provider. Later on, they, they spun out the service providers to still provide the services business. In AI, this is running a bit different because uh, what you see here with APO, or for example, here with autonomous machines that belong to Springer as a manufacturer from, from Carinthia, they don't sell the service. They really have a software product where you pay an annual license or a monthly license for it. So this is a complete shift of business model. And in that regard, AI is very different from, let's say, the previous wave of, of IT and digitalization that happened 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, speaking of business, uh, the funny thing is whenever you hear data-driven business models, most people have in mind some things like Uber, like Google, you know, has to be an internet company, has to be young, needs to have billions of dollars of investment. Funnily, this whole trend was more or less started in a far more, let's say, grounded industry, nam namely aircraft turbines. What you see here, yeah, good, this is the picture. But General Electric, for example, was 15 years ago already uh, going in the direction that in addition to the turbines, they sell a maintenance and analytics package where they optimize for you uh, the usage of the aircraft turbine, even while the aircraft is already in the air. So this is this is this 100 percent fits the bill of a data driven business model. And yeah, I sometimes find it funny that our, let's say, brick and mortar companies or industrial companies look in the direction of Silicon Valley, whereas you have the industrial conglomerates in the US, which have doing this for quite some time already. Uh, coming a little bit, circling a little bit back to what's now going on in Austria in the AI landscape. I mean, you might have noticed this is a quite large number of boxes in the upper part of startups. This means more than half of the companies here have a pure industry focus. This means you have companies specialized on serving agriculture or manufacturing or, or let's say uh, finance. Uh, what is a relatively high number are this 20% you see here with AI tech stack. This means you have companies which provide, for example, APIs or libraries, which later then are licensed to other AI companies or to, let's say, classical software engineers, software service companies, or even yeah, bigger companies, which build, uh, which build, let's say, for example, embedded hardware. Uh, enterprise intelligence is quite small. This has to do with the fact that when it comes to natural language processing, uh, Austria is surely suffering a little bit from being directly next to Germany. This means it's a little bit comparable to fintech, I would say. I mean, most of you surely know N26. N26 went to Germany because the environment in Berlin is just much better for a fintech startup. And for an NLP startup, I would say it's, it's pretty much the same because Austrian universities are quite good, as you have seen before, drone navigation, computer vision. In NLP, we still have catch up to do because it's, it's just not something that was in focus up, up, up until now. Uh, when it comes to the total AI adoption, a brief rundown, because you, 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 you're, de you're definitely interested in AI, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And if you're checking the news, you might think that all the companies worldwide, they already work on AI. So there's 
basically nothing left to do because everything has been already invented. I found this study quite eye-opening. This was conducted by Google two years ago. And they looked, uh, it, it was a survey conducted with the largest retailers in the world. They have in total 150 retailers, you know, like Walmart, Tesco, Spar, and, and, and so on. And they asked how many of these companies have more than 20 AI projects in progress. And it was just 60%. Then when it comes, how many of these, uh, let's say, pilot projects are actually leaving the idea stage and go into full implementation, it's less than half. I could say that's also okay, because it's, this, this is just a funnel that gets smaller. But the real kicker, and in my opinion, this is where the real problem is at the moment, uh, only 40% of the implemented cases uh, are so-called high value use cases. And what do I mean with that? Uh, of course, in theory, you could automate every single small step in a typical office. Then you save perhaps, I don't know, two hours per week. But in reality, it has a far bigger business impact if you do something that increase how much are your customers buying, how much are they spending, how many items are they buying. And even in retail, and this was the conclusion of this study, the companies are far too focused on, on efficiency gains. Think of this two hours saved per week and not so much how they can make more money. And the, the really strange thing about this is if you think of Amazon recommendation algorithms and so on, all the recommendation algorithms online, they, they are purely based on getting more engagement means more money. So this is something that the, the physical world still has to learn from the internet world. Yeah, with, with, with regard to the time, this is, uh, let, let me make this quick. How does an AI project typically look like? I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the steps POC, MVP, and production system. Uh, what is a little bit special for AI is, and this is where this feasibility check on the left hand side comes into play, very often uh, you just don't know at the beginning if the project can, can even be carried out. Is the data quality good enough? Do we have enough data? Is it possible from a, let's say, from an analytical perspective and so on? This is the reason why in, in the AI world, I would say this feasibility check has, has established itself as like the fourth pillar when, when it comes to AI projects. The, 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 the rundowns, yeah, this is just for completeness sake. You can have this later in the handout. Uh, yeah, last but not least, community-wise, what's going on in Austria? Uh, yeah, as uh, Karin mentioned in the beginning, I'm the founder or, or initiators of the of the nonprofit AI Austria. Uh, what do we do? On the one hand side, lots of policy work when it comes on the European level. Think of the AI Act and regulation. Here we also work very closely together with uh, similar organizations all across Europe. Additionally, since 2018, we started the AAIC, the Applied AI Conference, which yeah, good. This is, you, you, you saw it uh, with the AIC, which is now already one of the largest B2B AI conferences in, in Europe. So we have speakers from, from LinkedIn to Sony to, to unicorns to the largest investors and so on. Uh, best of all, everything is totally free. So if you just hit, let's say, our YouTube channel or, or LinkedIn, I think here I have this, just type AAC Applied AI Conference with like hundreds of hours of content and it's all, it's all available. So even here, most people don't even know that the AIC is coming from Austria. Yeah, with this, actually, I would like to hand over to Karin and ask, yeah, ask Karin if, if somebody asked the question in the audience, that's like a cross, a dual reference. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Clemens, for providing this really um, interesting insight into the business landscape of AI Austria. Um, two numbers I want to change. Um, and before we, I'm going to ask those numbers, I just want to point out that you will join us again tomorrow for the fireside chat with Matthias. And then mm -hmm. we'll go into a bit more detail in these different stages of how do you turn an idea into an actual business. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But two numbers I want to change, and hopefully this hackathon can contribute. One, we need to increase the number of female founders. And for this, of course, we have Karina from Women in AI joining us as a judge. And she's also going to share more about this professional network. And two is, I think, since we have a lot of students from Salzburg, 
we want to increase, of course, the numbers of AI uh, startups coming out of Salzburg. So what is your advice, Clemens, for the participants? What tips can you give them when they're looking at, because the next stage in the hackathon is to define different concepts of what kind of problems they can change thanks to AI. What, what would be your approach if you were part of the hackathon? Uh, very, it's often very helpful to look at one sector where AI is already very established mm -hmm. and then think how could this apply to the sector I'm aiming at. Example, mm -hmm. I was yesterday also mentor and, and judge at the hackathon that goes into wood and sustainability. And to my big surprise, what most of the teams and companies and forest owners are thinking at the moment, this is more or less on a on a generic level it's the same problem that cities have what do i mean with that uh, the forest owner wants to know is the tree healthy are they growing properly do i have a plague or bug infestation is a forest fire you know is this, is, is all related with geographic data and, and, and image data funnily in the when it comes to road damages and traffic signs, cities are already doing this nowadays. So basically, mm -hmm. when you look at cities, you can totally see what is realistic for a forest and what might need more investment, like IoT, for example. And I think this is a very helpful framework. Also, for example, when it goes into medicine, just look what is nowadays possible when it comes to large industry, like contract analysis, like market screening and so on, because this can give you a little bit of an idea how sophisticated this AI now when it comes to understanding text or what, it, what it's seeing there with pictures and text. Fantastic. I think that's a super helpful advice. I mean, getting inspired by industry, we already know that already use AI and see where it's not being applied yet. So thank you so much, Clemens, for your time. And mm -hmm. I really look forward to continuing our conversation with you tomorrow. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, thank, you, thank you. And ha happy hacking. Bye happy bye. hacking. <laughs> And I think that's um, that's the right phrase, happy hacking. I now want to share with you the different stages of your hackathon and what you have to keep in mind. So we go a bit more into the organizational part of it. So the hackathon is more or less divided into six stages. After my introduction, so after we're done with this call, you're going to meet your team on Discord. You have already been assigned to the team. And then I think it would be fun to, first of all, agree on a team name so that we don't have just teams that are called team one, two, and three. Then it's time for you to work on two to three different concepts, um, basically brainstorm some ideas which you want to focus on for this hackathon. So where do you want to build this solution? For which industry? For which specific use case? You then, in the fourth stage, discuss these concepts with your mentor. And basically, he will help you to define what is the best concept moving forward. And then he will give you the OK go. So as soon as you have the OK go, the green light, you can start building. And as mentioned, the mentors are available today until 8 PM and again tomorrow from 9 AM onwards. But you can continue working in your group way beyond 8 PM. Just make sure you get some sleep as well. And then tomorrow, um, you have to submit your presentation at 1 p.m. And we are really curious to see what we have come up with. So again, going into details, this is how this code looks like. You already see the different channels. You will be allocated. In case you're not allocated, in case you have issues finding your channel, just reach out to on Discord and we'll help you. So stages one and two is that. Then stage three is all about working in your team and really working on these concepts that you want to create. So two to three concepts. And we are looking for innovation solutions that leverage GPT-3, so the tool that Matthias had shared with you earlier. There was a briefing, a more in-depth briefing on uh, GPT-3 yesterday by Matthias and the team. In case you missed it, we placed the recording as well on Discord. You can find it there. It's around. 13 minutes for you to get more insights into this tool. It's again, it's really interesting. It's very creative. So this is what you can use as part of the hackathon. And you repair around two to three concepts and then you meet the mentors and then you will decide on which is the one you want to take forward. Then ultimately you have to build your prototype. So this is a teamwork. And again, we have various mentors that can support you. I'm going to share with you in a minute how you can reach out to us in case 
you need help. And I'll also, of course, put those slides afterwards in the chat. So get, you can again take a look at it um, in case you missed anything. And last but not least, presenting your presentation. Here, we would like you to keep your presentation below 30 minutes, 30 seconds. So that's the maximum duration. And this is also the time when the judges will be evaluating you. They will basically listen to your presentation. They may ask you some questions afterwards for clarification, and then they'll put down their scores. Um, who and how many of your team members present, it's totally up to you. You can have one team member presenting or all of you. Just make sure that you keep it within the allocated time of three minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and you can upload the presentation as PowerPoint or PDF. Uh, we'll share with you the details on how the uploading works tomorrow. And again, the deadline is 1 p.m. All right, so what is this challenge we want you guys to focus on? And I already mentioned a few keywords uh, before. Basically, the challenge should be based upon, or your solution should be based upon four uh, pillars. Artificial intelligence, of course, and with this GPT-3, it should have a sustainability aspect to it. What do we mean with sustainability? Well, you know, at first there should be, of course, a focus on the environment, but also on the human work. Does it make the work of certain um, employees, for example, easier? Does it provide a, best, a best, better service to customers? Um, does it uh, improve the collaboration between companies and the suppliers or partners and so on? So the sustainability aspect um, is very important and you decide on the industry. So industry agnostic, you decide which industry you want to focus on, and Clemens gave us some very good advice. Maybe there's an industry where we already see AI being used, and we take this, get inspired, and apply it in a field where AI isn't that common yet. This can be anything from sustainability in management, so anything related to logistics, to HR, to marketing, finance, sustainability in tourism, especially Salzburg is known as a very important touristic area in Austria. Sustainability in education, most of you are enrolled in universities, so I think this is your day-to-day -day work anyways. And of course, anything related to social and health sciences, for example. But again, those are only examples. You decide on the industry. So AI and GPT-3, sustainability, and any industry you wish you to focus on. How will you be evaluated? So we have defined six criteria, six evaluation criteria that the judges will use to evaluate each team. The first one, degree of completion. Is what you present us more or less complete? Did you manage to deliver it in the time allocated? Means from when I start speaking, this is when you start working, until 1 p.m. tomorrow. How is your presentation style? I think this is also very important because, as you know, having a great idea is one part, but it's always important as well to communicate in a, this idea in a convincing way, in an impactful way, to also excite others and get them on board. We, of course, want to understand what would be the business value if your prototype is actually turned into a business solution? What would be the impact? Does it actually make sense? And can it be really applied? And how innovative were you? How creative were you? How original is your uh, solution that you create as a team? Then, of course, we look as well, well, can it actually be implemented from a technology perspective? So is it actually possible to create this prototype and turn it into a tech solution? And finally, the sixth Criterion is just overall, how is our impression of you as a team? Each category, for each category, you can receive up to 10 points. So 10 is the highest. So the more points you have, of course, the better. All right. So I mentioned you're not alone on this journey. We're not going to throw you in cold water and then let you try to figure out how to swim. We are here to support you. And primarily our two mentors, namely Matthias, whom you have already met, and Pavel as well. So 
So those are two experts and they dedicate their time and their wealth of expertise to help you and your team really succeeding in this challenge. Plus, you can also reach out to the different teams. Again, putting here, this is where you're going to be in the teams allocated. We have different channels on Discord. And in case you have any more technical questions or just need any support and don't find Matthias and, and Pavel, just you know, put in the hashtag, I need help. Very obvious, I need help. So if you need help, hashtag, I need help. Or direct message Cuba Deep Learning Labs. So these are your resource, uh, resources. And again, 1 p.m. tomorrow, this is the deadline. This is when we want to see your presentations. And we're still going to share with you how you can upload them. All right. Having said this, um, I just want to thank the whole AI Hackathon team, our speakers for the day, especially Kuba as well, who is behind the stage and making sure that everything runs smoothly. And we. Yeah, on behalf of the whole team, I just want to wish you good luck and most important, have fun. And I'm really, really excited to seeing your solutions tomorrow at 1 p.m. All the best. Take care.